Well, friends, good morning and welcome again to Rise and Shine, our daily Bible study to inspire, inform, and impact your life in ways you never imagined possible. Today we're in chapter 10 of John's Gospel. Uh, we're coming to the end of the time of the festivals. If you remember, we started in chapter 5 where Jesus begins to redefine for us the Sabbath. In chapter 6, he enters into a time of Passover, uh, understanding all of the symbolism of Passover and what that means, that God feeds us with the manna from heaven. Um, in chapters 7, 8, and 9, we are taking a look at the impact of tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of, of Water and of Light. And now we've kind of come out of that, we're going into another festival. Jesus is going to redefine for us. We're into a season of Hanukkah. And we're going to talk about what that meant and uh, how that festival um, is going to impact how we understand who Jesus is, and especially his words here, as he takes on another aspect of what Jesus, of, of his mission and his ministry. We understand that the first 12 chapters of John's gospel are what are called the book of the signs, um, revealing Jesus reveals his mission and his ministry. He, uh, he helps us understand that Jesus is far more than just another prophet. Um, so he reveals both his um, authority over the festivals as well as the institutions of Judaism. After chapter 12, we get into what is known as the Book of Glory, where we talk about the glorification, the, um, the, the revealing of his divine uh, uh, prerogative, if you will. In, in the mission and the ministry. So today we're in chapter 10, and it's important that we understand the Feast of Hanukkah as we understand Jesus' words as he, as he lays them out. Um, in chapter, we see that in chapter 7, 8, and 9, there's this growing antagonism against what Jesus is doing as he begins to say, I am, um, all those who thirst come to me and, and I will give you uh, water to drink. Um, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Um, and of course, he makes that direct comparison between God and himself. You know, I, I, the, I am with the Father. I am in the Father. And so we see this building, um, this antagonism building. In, in chapter 10, Jesus now really, the, the leadership of Jerusalem is now starting to really come out against Prior to this, we were getting the Pharisees that were asking him questions. There were people that were dividing uh, the light and the darkness. And so we're going to see a lot more of, of this kind of um, antagonism, especially by the leadership in, in Jerusalem. Okay, So as we begin today, let us begin by uh, praying for our church and for its witness. Would you join with me, please? Father, I pray that you bring new life and blessings to Mount Pleasant far beyond anything that we could ask or imagine. Amen. So as we begin today, uh, we also want to pray for our discipleship. Uh, we pray that we'd add the courage to do the hard things that are necessary um, and also to hear Jesus' words and, and ruminate on them. Think about how they apply to us in our own generation. Would you join with me as we pray for a courageous heart? God, grant me a courageous heart willing to explore the unknown, trusting your voice to guide me. Save me from the emptiness of easy answers and safe shelters. Let me be bold and brave, willing to sacrifice temporary comforts and simple answers to find wonders beyond my wildest dreams. My heart tells me I was made for more and that all these things are possible with your help. Grant me courage to take the next bold step. Amen. So we're going to jump into chapter 10, and following that we're going to talk a little bit about um, where Hanukkah comes from and what its impact really is. Um, so let us begin. Jesus is speaking when he said, um, by the way, let me, let me uh, back up just a minute. Um, notice there's going to be a transition that's going to happen between chapter 9 and chapter 10. Um, in chapter 9, it ends by Jesus talking to the Pharisees and, say, and them saying, you know, are you saying that we're blind? And Jesus said, you know, you're if, if you had, knew that you were blind, then I could heal you, but because you are, you don't see uh, your own disability. Um, it, it remains because you are unwilling to change. So Jesus is speaking. He says, "Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gate." 
gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Okay, do you see the one-to-one comparison there? Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the, sh- for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to ste- steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and may have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired man is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. When the full flo- wolf attacks the flock and scatters it, the man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, and I must bring them also. They, too, will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father." The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Again, here's a connection uh, back to chapter 9. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. I and the Father are one. Again, Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from from my Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he has called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent him into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy, because I said I am God's son? Do not Believe, do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. He stayed, there he stayed, and many people came to see him. They said, Though John never performed a sign, all that John has said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so we're going through this progression, right? We've gone through Sabbath, we've gone through Passover, we're going through tabernacles. Now we're in Hanukkah. What is it that we know about Hanukkah? Well, Hanukkah is kind of a celebration of what it really is called the rededication of the temple. And it kind of goes back to about um, to, uh, the second century BC when uh, Jerusalem was under Greek control. It was under Hellenistic control. And during that time, there was a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes who was ruling in Jerusalem. 
And in order to wipe out the Jews, what they tried to do is take the temple and desecrate it and make it for uh, paganistic worship. Um, but over time, the, the, the Jewish rebellion began to pick up. And as the Greeks began to be focused more in, in the uh, western part of uh, Asia Minor, the Greeks began to, I mean, the Jews rose up and began to fight against the, the Greeks and, and they kicked them out of Jerusalem. They, they took over uh, Jerusalem. Um, and the man that did that was a man by the name of Judas Maccabee. And what Judas ended up doing is when they moved all of the Greeks out, they went back to uh, the temple. But they had found that over the years, a lot of the priests had so compromised uh, in order to get along with the Greeks that they much preferred their job with the Greek and their position in, the, in society rather than keeping to the law of, of the Torah. And so the, de the temple had to be rededicated. And one of the things that they tried to do is then uh, go back and cleanse all of the elements. They took all of the altar apart and brought in new stones and, and made it all, all brand new. Not the, not the structure itself, but the altar um, that was there. And during the combat, the, the way that Hanukkah developed, the way the menorah developed, um, was the idea that during the battle uh, that was raging in um, Jerusalem at that time, they had a bowl that they would light the lamp before God. And the story is, is that that lamp, even though it was out of oil because of the, of the battle, they couldn't bring in fresh oil for the, for the lamp that the lamp continued to burn, and they took that as a miracle. And, and for eight continuous days, uh, it burned in the, in the temple to, to kind of symbolize that God was with them. And so uh, Hanukkah then became a celebration of rededication of the temple and a rededication of the people themselves, of, of Jewish nationalism and identity. Okay? So what is it that they were called to do? So there's, it's this time of visioning, if you will, of remembering who they are, the God's people, of not going back to these, uh, letting the temple and the, the rituals fall into disrepair. And so it is, a, it is known as a festival of dedication. And you will see that in um, verse 22, then they came to the festival of dedication. Now, this happens, if, <clears throat> excuse me, this happens in chapter, in verse 22, and so everything, though, that precedes it, because it is radically different, if you notice, prior to this, in chapter 9, Jesus is talking about uh, blindness, about, you know, light and darkness. Now he makes a shift, and he's talking in chapter 10 immediately about being a good shepherd. And this, cons this idea of being a shepherd correlates with Hanukkah, because the idea is, is that Shepherds in Israel have a very um, interesting standing. I mean, oftentimes shepherds were often the lowest people in society, but they had this kind of mythical uh, status, right? Kings were considered shepherds. Throughout the Old Testament, God is our good shepherd. Um, he shepherds his people. Um, in Psalm 23, right, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, you know, that, that symbolism has great, incredible religious overtones. And, but it's often referred to in terms of its leadership. And so when Jesus begins talking here, he's talking specifically to the Jewish leadership um, about what that means. All right? So it has this time of uh, lighting the, the, the candles of rededication of the temple, uh, rededication of the people back to God. So Jesus now is going directly uh, after the leadership uh, when he starts talking about what it means to be a good shepherd and what it means to be a bad shepherd. Now, if you want to read more about the time of Hanukkah and the impact, um, I, wanted, I, I would refer you to uh, the uh, book of the Maccabees. First Maccabees has a lot about the Jewish campaign, about what Judas Maccabee and how his rededication, his, uh, you know, his fervor and his intensity really inspired the Jews in this time. Okay, so there's this time um, where Jesus is focusing on our cultural identity of, of leadership, what it means, uh, how we move forward. 
okay? So the first thing that he does is, if you remember in John's gospel, the, these constant differences, these contrasts, right? We have light and dark. Um, we have, um, it, for uh, Nicodemus, we have new birth. We have right and wrong. We have some people that are, are, can blind and now they can see. All that kind of stuff. But now you come to the time of, of the sheep and the shepherd. And the first thing that he kind of goes is, he, he talks about how um, the shepherd will be, will be the protector of the sheep. He goes through the sheep gate. Um, oftentimes, and, and you have to, you, you know, you can read a, a bunch of this, that shepherds would take out, oftentimes take out the whole flock of the community out into the, uh, into the wildness of the Judean wilderness in order to graze. And then in the evening, they would often find a little, a little cave or um, these little um, stables that were set up in different locations in order to protect the sheep. So if you have like a hundred sheep at night in the darkness, you have to kind of keep them corralled together. And so they would, have, they would go into a cave or into a pen and the shepherd would then be right there at the gate in order to make sure the sheep didn't get out. And of course, the outside would often be um, either a wall or some kind of briars um, in order to keep uh, the shepherd, the sheep enclosed. So Jesus is talking about the role of leadership in, in, Ju in Judaism, in the temple. And he's talking about being the sheep gate, but he's also talking about how the bad shepherds care nothing for their sheep um, how, because they're just hired. They're doing it for the money. They don't really have anything invested in the sheep themselves, all right? So Jesus is talking about, um, you know, how his sheep know him. Now, the other part of this that's really fascinating, like we talk about light and dark, about the division that is coming, we see that as a constant theme in John's gospel, right? Because John here is saying his sheep know his voice. The reason that you're not getting this, he says to the Pharisees, is because you don't know my voice, because you're not one of my sheep. Um, as, as a matter of fact, at the very end in, in verse 6, uh, if I, well, actually, if I go up to vo verse 4, he says, he goes on ahead of them. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. They will never follow you. In fact, they will run away from him, right? So some sheep are being drawn to Jesus, and some are going to be running away. And then, of course, like in verse 6, he makes it abundantly clear. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they couldn't understand what he was telling them. They don't understand his words, right? So John is saying even the Pharisees are not one of his flock, right? They don't understand. Now, he goes in and says, now, look, you have other shepherds, but they're just robbers. Um, they come in order to steal and to, and to kill and to destroy, be aware of who they are. And so he's making this comparison with them. Um, he reveals himself. Um, as a matter of fact, he goes on to talk about the Father and I are one, right? He, he makes it abundantly clear. Um, so th this is what outrages them, right? That he's, he's now not only revealing the ultimate about his identity. Okay, and here's the thing. Jesus is not just a person that is representing God. He is, he is God himself that has come into the world. Um, that there's more, that you, there's more to, to him and who he is in this, in this world. Um, the, the, my point, I guess my point here is that Jesus is not saying, I, I am a prophet that is representing God, but I am God that has come among you. And that's, that's the powerful revelation um, the, of what he's trying to get across here. Okay, so now we're, so now we're kind of coming through this. So why, why the connection to Hanukkah? Because Hanukkah is the rededication of the temple. It, it asks the question at this point, when Judas Maccabee goes back to the temple, he has a very hard time finding a really pure, holy man to rededicate the temple. And so Judas Maccabee does it himself. He rededicates the temple by rebuilding it. And this caused a question for the Jews, like, okay, so what does it mean then to be rededicated? Who can then rededicate 
the temple, the holiness of the temple, who represents God. Um, and so Jesus is inviting us again to say, I am the good shepherd, right? I will lay down my, I will rededicate the temple, which is my own life. I will lay down my life only to pick it back up again. I have the authority to do that. And again, he is projecting into the signs of the glory that we will understand. Um, at this point, we have kind of reached the culmination of everything that Jesus wants to reveal about himself. Um, that God's judgment has come into the world, that judgment is the division between light and dark, between sheep's, sheep and goats, between those that hear Jesus and those that don't, between those who are blind and those that don't yet know that they're blind. Um, and so we see this idea that, that the darkness is fighting against the light, trying to overcome the light, um, and John I mean, and John is representing the conflict that happens over Jesus' claim. When Jesus says, then those sheep um, that want to pick up stones because they don't hear Jesus and they don't understand. But it always ends the same, it really ends the same way um, chapter 8 ended. If you go back to chapter 8, um, um, yeah, no, actually, chap yeah, chapter 8. Uh, verse 10, even as he spoke, many believed in him. In chapter 10, it ends that in that place, even, even though he's saying all these things, many believed in Jesus, right? So you're, you're moving now from the spiritual aspect of what Jesus is doing, and people are still embracing this new identity. So Jesus has come to the culmination. And now we understand that the things that Jesus does are, are not just you know, they're not recorded here just to add filler, but they're inviting you to see further. So what happens at the end? At the end, Jesus now leaves Jerusalem. It tells us that he leaves and he departs. He went back across the Jordan to where John had been baptizing in the early days, right? Why? He's now leaving Jerusalem. Jesus's revelation of himself, his preaching, and his teaching has reached its culmination. It is finished. He has now shared who he is to the leadership of Jerusalem. He is the good shepherd. He has come to lay down his life and to give us life and to have it in abundance, which we don't currently have. Okay, so now he's leaving. Now, the next time that obviously he, he makes it, it is not to come as a revelation, to give more of himself, okay? Now, we begin chapter 11 by the raising of Lazarus, and we're going to talk about more about that next time, and the power that that's going to have to help us understand more of who Jesus is. But his teaching and his proclamation of his identity have now ended. And somebody once said that God's greatest judgment on everyone is when our we're so closed off, we no longer hear, we no longer understand um, who God is, and He removes His revelation from us. So that's what we're seeing in chapter 10. Jesus has this final statement about what it means to be the Good Shepherd. Um, the sheep, you and I, hear His voice and are drawn to it. There are others that hear His voice and are repelled by it. Right? So we need to understand that God is at work in separating the sheep and the goats, the light and the dark, the blind from those that can see. Well, friends, I hope that you continue to, to dig deeper, uh, continue to feast on God's Word, and hope that it continues to strengthen you and bring you uh, hope. Friends, I pray that the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit will rest upon you and give you peace. Until next time, blessings be with you.